you, Allison, and thank you guys so much for being here today. I'm excited to spend a little bit of time with you. Um, as Allison said, my name is Lindsay, Lindsay Bishop Gilmore. I'm a senior program manager at, here at CSH. I'll tell you a little bit about CSH and uh, give some time for my colleagues to introduce themselves as well. We are gonna be using the chat a lot today, so I encourage you to drop things into the chat. Um, we're gonna have some questions and hopefully some dialogue via chat as well, and keep introducing yourself. I would love to see who is in the room. So let me advance to the next slide. So we're excited to be with you today around a, a active, assertive engagement and de-escalization. Um, and we're gonna be dropping some links into the chat for resources as well, and the learner guide that goes along with today's session. So just a little bit about what CSH does and where I work. Um, CSH is a national nonprofit. Um, we have offices and staff all over the country. There's about 140 of us now that work across the country. Um, our focus is really to help communities create housing for the most marginalized in communities for people to stay stably housed, but also be able to thrive within their lives. Um, we do this work um, in four different ways. The first is training and education, so like today. The second is around lending for site, so for site-based supportive housing projects, we can provide pre-development lending for projects. We also work on policy reform at the state, local, and federal level, and then um, work in partnership with um, government, private funders, providers to provide consulting and technical assistance. We have three kind of key drivers that um, kind of drive our work that you'll hear us touch on a little bit throughout the, the presentation today. The first is the commitment to using data equitably to drive systems change. The other is to really help um, supportive housing tenants and others really thrive in their community. And so for us, that's really moving beyond housing stability, um, but really helping people be grounded in community um, and find a joy out of their lives. And then the last piece is really weaving in race equity through all of the trainings that we do. So we're excited to be with you. Um, just a couple of things. So we have a national training center um, where you can access both free and fee-based trainings. For the, month of, for the month of March, we have, as an employee appreciation, we are offering um, five of our fee-based fee trainings um, available for free. And so um, Jasmine just dropped the link into the chat. Yeah, just a few days before the free, before they, the March free period will end, but wanted to share those with you guys today as well. So just some introductions. I'm, as I said, I'm Lindsay. I um, am based in Detroit. I've worked with CSH for about 11 years, um, both here in Michigan and in Chicago. Um, and I'm excited to be with you. I will turn it over to Catherine to introduce yourself. Hi everybody, I'm Catherine Destelrath. Um, I just recently joined CSH as the director of the Michigan work. Uh, so I am really excited to be here with you all and do this training today. Jasmine? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jasmine Morgan. I am a senior program manager. Um, happy to be here with you folks today, learn from you guys, and have hopefully have some good conversations. Thanks, Jasmine. Yeah, I want to stress that um, you all are all experts in the work that you do, and so we look at this as peer engagement, as Jasmine said, and look forward to kind of learning from, from you all. Um, and so, um, uh, as we go, please drop things into the chat and we look forward. We're starting with our first question. As we're thinking about active, in, active engagement and de escalization the first question I have for you all is, from your perspective, what causes people to escalate? You can think about yourself, you can think about um, your family, you can think about the people that you work with. What, um, what causes people to escalate? Stress, feeling misunderstood, triggers that they may have, receiving some bad news, the inability to, uh, to, to communicate how they're feeling, not being seen. You guys are typing faster than I can read. When someone is pushed out of their comfort zone, oh, that's, in, that's a good one. Feeling threatened or perceived threats, the inability to regulate their emotions, feeling lack of support, feeling vulnerable. Yes, yes, yes. 
I start with this question, being tired or hungry, absolutely. Those little things in our lives, absolutely. If they have medication issues, health issues, those are all things that can cause people to escalate. Um, and the, I think the other important thing to, to think about, um, ooh, being on parole and not um, being able to do what you want, so not being able to control or have um, kind of choices in your life, being uncomfortable in the environment. Yes, yes, yes. I think it's important as we're talking about this to acknowledge the kind of power dynamics that that are that are a part of our work. Um, oftentimes, the people that that you are working with see you as staff doing this work as having the power. You may be making decisions about the services that they're receiving. You may be making decisions about the housing that they may or not may or may not receive. And so understanding those power dynamics can also be really important as you think about how people escalate. Um, there are many reasons that can influence how people perceive and respond to the environment that, that, that they're in. Being person-centered and trauma-informed means that you are understanding um, what might impact how a person that you're interacting with or engaging with. One important factor is to understand if you know, the folks that you're working with, what are their underlying triggers, as some of you all mentioned? Are there underlying health conditions? Are there things like them being on, on parole that can impact some of the behaviors? And so it's really taking what you know about the people that you're working with and using that to understand and engage how you work with them. So for us, um, in a lot of trainings that we've done, we always really think about things from a trauma-informed approach. Um, we recognize that de escalization can be the scariest and the most anxiety provoking part of our work. The constant worry of us having to handle a client or a tenant that's in crisis, or maybe you're working with someone who has a tendency to maybe lose control of their emotions or has a violent past. So you're, fact, you're dealing with all of those things on a daily basis. And I think for us, it's centering and reminding ourselves the reason that we went into this work in the first place, starting from that strength-based based approach for us and a more positive perspective can be helpful in helping to set the tone and getting in the right frame of mind to really um, lend to learning. So one of the major pieces of how we approach this work is through a trauma-informed lens. Um, I would assume many of you all know trauma-informed really well so I just wanna do a quick level setting on what it is. So SAMHSA, we typically use the SAMHSA definition, says that trauma-informed approach is a program or an organization or a system that's trauma-informed. So meaning they realize the impact of trauma and the paths for recovery, that you recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma for clients, family, staff, and others, respond by fully integrating knowledge of trauma into your policies and procedures, and then actively re, um, resist re-traumatization. For us, acknowledging that every person's story is different, and for a lot of the folks that we work with, we may never know the full extent of the sorts of trauma that they've experienced in their past, but really approaching with curiosity can really help shift some of the interactions that you have. We're talking, we brought trauma-informed kind of the forefront of this conversation because research has shown that trauma really disrupts um, your central nervous system and overwhelms on a person's ability to cope. And we know that folks that we work with have experienced significant amounts of trauma um, and that trauma can uh, manifest in a number of ways. It can often lead you to feeling vulnerable, helpless or afraid it may interfere with your relationships that you build with one another. It impacts your fundamental, self, your fundamental beliefs about yourself, about others, and about your place in the world. And as you can imagine, all of this then impacts how someone responds in a crisis. And so all of these things that are part of our past and the environment that we're in right now impact how we respond during that crisis or when our emotions are heightened especially if there's a stimulus that provokes or brings a painful reminder of that trauma. Part of our training today is really thinking about how do you plan ahead for difficult client interactions and also have a backup plan.
I had mentioned that CSH, one of our kind of drivers to our work is centering um, race equity. And so we, um, to really advance in trauma-informed approaches, it's critical that you're person-centered, that your approach and interactions with people honor their cultural, historic, or gender issues. Um, that those things are not only shapes our past, but it's how we interact with people today. And it's important to kind of factor those things in when you're feeling comfortable. Many people mentioned in the chat, not feeling seen or heard or being misunderstood. All of those things can connect to our culture. Culture is so important. Um, it can influence how a person might ask for help or even if they do ask for help um, and the stigma that may be attached to asking for help. The language that a person uses and how they express it and how, you know, how they express happiness or sadness. Their family structure, perhaps the way they cope is impacted by culture. And so some people are going to cope individually and some people are gonna cope more with a group. And all of that's really dynamic and changes continuously. It's influenced by our beliefs and our environment, what I think many of you all mentioned in the chat as well. The other important part to this is cultural humility. So instead of cultural competency, we talk about cultural humility um, from a, and I approach it from a place of, I don't think I'm ever gonna be fully competent in all cultures, all people, but I can approach with a sense of curiosity. And so cultural humility is a lifelong commitment to that self-evaluation and self-critique, really to address the power imbalances in given relationships. And so with practice, when you're practicing cultural humility, it's, it's really important to approach things with curiosity. You're probably gonna hear me say that word a lot, but also admit when you make a mistake and cause unintentional harm. And I know for me, this is not something that historically I've done really well at. It's just saying I, I've made a mistake. I've perhaps done something that has caused unintentional harm. And so exploring kind of your own bias is key. You know, it involves an ongoing process of self-reflection, working to understand oneself and recognizing that culture is fluid. People may also experience trauma related to these differences. And so I'm talking about this and, and prioritizing this for our discussion today because we have great disparities within Michigan. Our data shows it. Um, when you look at um, just the homeless system alone and you could look at welfare, corrections, a number of different systems to look at this data, there's significant disparities. So in Michigan's general population, 79% of the pop population is white, but in Michigan's uh, population of people experiencing homelessness, 52% of the population is black. And so there's significant disparities there you know, um, catastrophic events such as slavery, slavery or time periods within our history to legal segregation have led to a lot of denial of access to equal rights. Um, and, I, you know, these things are, are looked at as history and part of our history, but there's longstanding effects that continue to show up in the way in which we operate today. Um, and so for many of the disparities we see, they directly contribute to the black population experiencing higher rates of homelessness than others. So we really wanted to center this today as we're thinking about how you engage with people, recognizing um, how you're showing up and the biases that you may be carrying. Um, and so in recognizing those disparities, we must acknowledge kind of the shift that's happened in our society over the past several years. Um, many of us have lived with the witness of structural racism and the impacts of structural, structural racism. But the more recent events that have become very public and very visual and oftentimes are kind of triggering or traumatizing, um, it has raised the level of awareness for other people. We want to emphasize that, that here as we think about what leads to escalation, we need to think about what impacts the way people respond to others, especially within those crises. And so another part of trauma that it kind of impacts the way people show up and engage is racialized trauma. Um, it's uh, kind of one form of trauma that imp impacts uh, uh, people of color significantly. It's acute, complex, and chronic form of trauma. It's, all, it's been compared to and research has shown that the effects of it are similar to PTSD 
um, racialized trauma um, is oftentimes chronic and something that people of color experience the majority of their lives. Um, and so as we apply this trauma-informed lens and as we're thinking about active engagement, we need to recognize that folks are recovering from trauma um, and maybe less likely to share their story, less likely to engage, less likely to trust for the fear of being further, further st stigmatized. And so all of these things are impacting how people are showing up, what makes someone perhaps escalate or if, they, if the way in which they're expressing their emotions, all of these things impact that and understanding this kind of helps frame the population that you're working with. So we all bring advantaged and disadvantaged perspectives. Um, we have to recognize the, the power, power dynamics just naturally by the positions that you hold. There's power dynamics with the clients that you're working with. Um, and so in thinking about your identity, uh, most of us in looking at this have advantaged or disadvantaged identities. There are oppressed identities and identities that privilege is attached to. Um, whenever we are in a position of power for one of our advantaged identities, it's important for us to be sensitive of how that is playing out. And so if you are a white person that is in a supervisory role, you're going to be thinking about, you should be thinking about how that's impacting your engagement with people. Um, and thinking about where do you hold power, um, your power may change based on where you are in the environment that you're working, whether you're with family or friends. And so really thinking about the populations that you work with and where power lies for them as well. And also just acknowledge that this kind of diagram is not exclusive. It does not include all identities, but really thinking about what are the identities that you hold. So we wanna move into kind of the components of assertive and active engagement and then talk through some de-escalization techniques. Um, you know, when we're thinking about de-escalization, it's really important that um, you invest in the relationship, if at all possible, um, as a way to really plan for understanding that crisis is going to come up, just these things are going to happen. And so building um, kind of a plan from the get-go can allow you to better respond within those moments. So the first piece that I want to touch on is patience. I will say this is, I'm starting with this one because this is probably the hardest for me. Um, goals that are often the hardest to reach are the ones that take the longest um, and it can take a long time. And sometimes that process of kind of change can feel very non-linear. Um, and just as an example, um, it's akin to the moment that we're in right now, 400 years of racial oppression is not gonna be solved overnight. Um, so in the moment, it can be really hard to be patient, especially um, when you're having a conversation with someone and you think they need to do something or you think there's a decision that they need to make or a step that they need to make. Um, it's important to really have that patient and truly meet someone where they're at. Are there other ways that you can engage with this person? Are there things that you can start working on right now? What are the things that matter to them? Um, and then I, I wanna acknowledge that you all have many kind of funding expectations that you have to meet. You have forms that you have to complete. You have data that you have to enter. And so it's really easy to get fixated on the things that we're required to do. Um, what our supervisor asks of us, what our funder needs us to do, that sometimes we sacrifice that patience, that trauma-informed lens because we have to meet those deadlines. Um, I encourage you all to kind of always ask yourself, is this the best time to try to get this signature on this form? Is there another way to do it? Can I wait a week? And so really thinking about and, and balancing the things that you're required to do and where the client is at that moment in time. So the second piece is waiting for a break. Um, so when someone, for example, is yelling and is very frustrated and is expressing their anger and frustration through that yelling, there's gonna be a moment in time where they're gonna to have to take a breath. They're gonna pause for the next thought. And for some people, yelling is a way to get it all out. Um, and sometimes taking, the, taking a breath and just listening for someone um, and giving them the space to yell can be really important. 
So waiting for that break when someone takes a breath or pauses for their next thought can be the moment in which you can engage. And of course, it's not yelling back. It's not telling someone what to do, but it's, demonstrate that, it's demonstrating that you're listening, that you care for them and you hear what they, they're saying. And recognizing that most issues can't be resolved in that moment and won't be resolved in that moment, but just acknowledging that sometimes people just need to get that anger and frustration out. Of course, ensuring safety for all people involved. I think another thing to remember and just kind of waiting um, is that sometimes when we interrupt or we make sudden movements, that in and of itself can escalate things. So really waiting for that break. The other piece of engagement is ensuring your assertiveness. So by definition, assertive is getting the, the art of getting your needs met without infringing on the rights of others. And so when we think about assertiveness with clients and engaging with clients, it's that you must go to them again and again and again. You may call them again and again and again, and they may not answer. You may um, try to reach them in a number of different ways, but it's that kind of persistence and assertiveness that you're continuing to show up. It's also, assertiveness is also a bit of um, kind of the art of interaction, always leaving before they're ready for you to go. You know, really don't wear out your welcome when you're with them and look for those opportunities, uh, window of opportunities to really engage. And then as you're thinking about assertiveness, it's also really important to consider the way gender and racial dynamics are playing out. You know, are you working with a male client or a female client? Really thinking about kind of how those dynamics are gonna play out. So the next piece is really interacting without an agenda. And I recognize this can be really hard if you have many clients, you have a very high caseload. This can be really hard to do. Um, but being agendaless um, and the ability and willingness to just be just be present, treating the time together in and of itself as a as a goal and a, something that you've achieved. Um, it's these interactions without agenda that you're starting to invest and build that foundational uh, that foundation of trust with people. Um, and it may be, you know, that you're just meeting with someone in passing or setting a, a check-in with someone for 30 minutes and you're just having coffee. Um, for some people, it may take kind of multiple visits to complete paperwork. And so using that as a way to just spend time together to get to know one another and demonstrate what motivational interviewing and re reflective listening looks like. The next piece is around mindful communication, how you communicate is important every single time that you interact with someone. But if things do begin to escalate, if a client becomes upset or stimulated, then what and how you say is even more important. So in those moments of crisis, the words that you use become even, even, important, even more important. You wanna speak with confidence. You wanna keep things simple. If you're unsure, don't say anything. If you don't know what to say, don't say anything yet. Wait until you have found kind of the appropriate response or phrasing and, you know, have some common things in your back pocket, you know, asking things like, can you help me understand? Um, can you explain this a little bit more? Will you feel safer if? And so having things that you can kind of phrases that you can come back with or questions that you can ask. So when I think about mindful communication, I really think about motivational interviewing and reflective listening and being really aware of all of your nonverbal cues. So when I think about listening, it's that you're listening not only with your mind, but with your eyes, with your body, that your whole presence is there and people can sense that. And that can do a lot to build that foundational trust as well. So I've said trust relationship building a lot and it sounds really simple. Um, and so I kind of go back to myself and think about what makes me feel safe and supported and the relationships that I have. And I encourage you to ask yourself that. When do you feel the most safe? When do you feel supported? Um, and I don't always, when I'm entering a new space or meeting new people, I definitely don't feel supported. And so recognizing that the clients that you're engaging with aren't going to enter with this trust. 
that it really is a process. Um, and think about your relationship with your clients as a currency that you're trading in. And so you need to build up kind of that relationship, that currency. So when critical conversations happen or when emotions are high or there's a crisis, you're building on that relationship and that trust that you, that you already have. And so for you thinking about, are you setting realistic expectations? What are you promising or not promising to the people that you're working with? Um, rapport and trust building are really the foundation of tenant-centered service delivery. Um, and so it's, it's important to understand that as people, as you're engaging with people, they've probably interacted with a lot of systems in their lives and probably have a significant distrust of those systems and have always been told what to do, where to go, what to eat, what time to get up, what time to go to sleep. Um, and that oftentimes is going to take, you know, that's going to impact the way that they're engaging with you. And so for you, it's about opening up new pathways to demonstrate that maybe you're different than the previous engagements that they've had and that you're creating a space for them to be heard. This stuff happens both formally and informally. So when you think about formal, this is about scheduling appointments, keeping those appointments. It may be kind of care coordination. You're helping navigate benefits that, that, that they're trying to access um, and making it known that you can help clients kind of make those connections with other kind of partners within the community. And then informal is sometimes just as important. Um, you know, if, you're, if you have the opportunity in a building where you're engaged, where you're seeing and crossing paths with tenants a lot, you have those five minute opportunities where you may pass someone to just catch up. You may know that someone really loves basketball and it's March Madness. And so creating that engagement. So really looking for those informal kind of conversations that, um, that don't feel like your traditional case management topic. And doing kind of all of this is being person-centered, trauma-informed and culturally responsive. And then the last thing, um, as you're engaging with people and, um, and, and perhaps responding in crisis is just the, um, creating the, within your team the permission to tap out. And so this is something that as an organization, as a supervisor, you can create this culture that if staff feel kind of overwhelmed, that maybe they're not the best staff to respond in those situations, that you're creating a space for them to tap out, to leverage other staff, pull in staff that maybe have more experience. Um, it's also, you know, if you're recognizing that your staff are burned out or emotionally at risk, it's creating a space for people to do more teamwork and recognizing that, you know, pulling in other colleagues or tapping out and saying, maybe I'm not the best person. Um, it's not a sign of weakness or incompetence. It's the focus is really on safety and success for everybody. Um, and, um, you know, it's about establishing some signals and phrases that you can use as a team that you need that support. And it also helps to reinforce boundaries and self care. And so as if you're a supervisor creating that culture of allowing staff to ask for support, creating the space for staff um, if they need that support and, and wanting to pull in other people. And with that, I... I'm going to turn it over to Jasmine. Lindsay, we did have a comment Sorry. in the chat. I wasn't sure if you were able to see it. Did you want me to read it for you? Yes, please. I'm sorry. No, you're great. It just came in. Um, so it says, I'd like to also bring awareness to cultural humility for all individuals, regardless of race, color, background. As a daughter of legal immigrant, oh, sorry, immigrants from Europe, there are various assumptions placed upon me and there are hundreds of thousands who face similar examples of discrimination. In other words, just as you should have cultural humility in situations with those who seem different from you, please do the same for those who seem to look like you too. Thank you very much. Yes, and true. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. I will turn over to Jasmine. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, so we are transitioning um into a space where i want you folks to think about what do you find yourself internally internally struggling with when it comes to de-escalation um we want to take a pause for a moment to do some self-reflection and so 
if you are dealing with your client's trauma as well of your own trauma, we want to be able to practice space um, that allows for uh, de-escalation. When you find yourself in some places, um, how have you been able to find the de-escalation? And if you guys want to drop it in the chat, that's great. Or if you want to prefer to, to speak out, that's also good if you want to raise your hand. I don't know if they have the ability to raise your hand, actually, now that I thought through that. Are there any options or times that folks have had to uh, come with some de-escalation? Zakari, did I say that right? Zakari, maybe. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, you said that right. Awesome. Talk to us about some ways that you guys have, uh, you've been able to do some de-escalation. Well, I usually just listen to the yelling and screaming for a little while and try to just um feel my body and feel grounded in like where I'm at before I respond I've tried to learn in my life to not react and mm -hmm. to not respond to someone escalating mm -hmm. um especially with the yelling part because um I grew up in a family of yellers mm -hmm. and that's very that's a very easy response for me to go to as well Mm -hmm. And being a professional that I am and being, um, you know, a support staff for our clients, um, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to start yelling back at them. And it would actually kind of take me into an adolescent level. But that could easily happen for me. Um, mm -hmm. I am definitely not saying that I am above that happening. <laughs> so I take a few breaths. And I just try to stick to the task that is being requested or that I am seeking from them, which is either to take a medication or, you know, um, I often ask them if they've had anything to eat, you know, have you had anything to eat today? I usually, you know, provide a meal or some snacks. So I usually kind of go there. That's kind of my go-to pretty quickly. Okay. Okay. when someone's escalating as I okay. offer them food. <laughs> well, fixes everything. I know it does for me. Um, if I could have a, a couple of cookies, I'm sure I'll be in a way better mood than when I had them when I didn't have them. So food is definitely a way to a lot of people's hearts. Um, thank you folks for dropping things in the chat. One thing I did want to sort of highlight um, is that Amy dropped in the chat that always remember that it's not personal and the reasons for being upset typically has nothing to do directly with me. Um, in my work as a former case manager, I had to recognize that folks were dealing with a lot and it was more than they would just share with me as their, their regular old case manager, right? Um, and so really stepping outside of myself, um, recognizing like, you know, this really isn't about me. This is about their situation and not take things so personally um, as they're hollering and screaming and such. Um, so thank you uh, for that. Some other things were just allowing, um, noticing the early signs, especially if someone you're familiar with, reading the room and see if there's something that's bothering them or need to take a break, take a walk, get a drink. Um, those are uh, very great. Are there are there others? I want to give space to allow folks to make comments. Thank you all for dropping those in the chat and thanks for speaking up. All right. And then our last one, doing my best to remember it's not personal and not feed into their behaviors or state. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Ken. And so we are um, as we think about de-escalation and engagement through the trauma-informed lens, let's start with the principles of safety. How do you keep yourself, those you're working with, and in, um, you're encountering both safe physically and emotionally, right? There are many ways to do this, um, and I'd love if you shared ideas or strategies that you employ in the chat, ways that you've just made sure that um, you're actually safe in the position. Um, a big piece of making sure that both you and who you're working with and the folks that you're engaging with have an exit 
So never put yourself between your client and a way to leave and vice versa for them, right? So not standing in front of the door, it's not blocking their view, you not being able to see the door, um, being able to understand what situation you're in. Are you in a place that it is just you and, and you and the client speaking? Are you in a larger place where others may be able to hear and things that'll trigger that and it, that'll intertwine and trigger within your conversations? Um, I have been told um, that folks who have done outreach, that they've realized a, a number of their clients um, would sit in corners of the room or when we're in a meeting, um, they would never have their backs to people, right? And so as this particular case manager got to learn that client and got to know the people that they were working with, they heard all kinds of stories as to the reason that those interactions were there. So what seems pretty outrageous or maybe strange to us, that it is a very rhyme or reason to the reasons that folks are interacting and behaving in the ways that they are. Um, veterans who've had combat, people who've been in abusive relationships and not able to leave. Um, you can't take their trauma away, but you can be informed and um, be sure that you're making decisions in you folks' interaction with them um, that will not add to their trauma. And one of those things could very well be blocking their exit route, right? So let's think about safety and what happens when we're afraid. All of us, we all come into an instance in our lives where something we were afraid and it really put us in a, a fight or flight response, right? So as you're in this flight or fight response, you really activate um, things in your body that will activate adrenaline, which is releases some endorphins in our bloodstream. Um, then it prepares our muscles for tension. All of these biological things happen. And for all you know, you know, you just have, you're, you're just upset, but there are a lot of other biological things that, you know, without understanding are happening and it creates the the escalation right and so all of these happen quite quickly um, and they can result in things like an increased heart rate and the feeling of butterflies in our stomach dry mouths dilated pupils etc right all of these things happen and they are preparing you for your safety, right? To be able to protect your safety and your space in the way, that, in the places that you are and the things that you have doing, right? Um, they're survival techniques. We all have experienced them in some shape, way, or form. And maybe it's not in the instance that we are having conversations with a one-on-one -on -one person that we experience um, uh, those body actions. But at the same time, we, we've been there before. It, it helps us to understand where folks um, are coming from. Um, it really helps us to figure out how afraid we are and then what happens after that. And so between the almost 200 folks that are on this call, we have all had different reactions to different things and recognizing that, you know, there is not one way um, to be able to continue to keep folks safe. Um, and understanding what triggers to say, you know, what triggers happen and things that can be said and things that can be done that really, you know, puts folks over the edge on, and where they are in their life at that time. All of this is just to say that it's important um, to be aware of this work as you educate yourself and to reduce those things from happening, right? So some of the tools um, that were mentioned around relationship building, get to know might trigger people and to avoid those triggers. Um, interaction without judgment, determine if it makes sense to me in public, in a, in a public space, or if we can meet more of a private space, um, meeting offices, some folks do better when they are, it's just you and them. Um, it is really the notion of meeting folks where they are and allowing them to be more comfortable in your interactions. In my work of being a, a former case manager, the clients that were able to really have um, a conversation with me beyond their housing needs or beyond what they have going on now, we found that there, there, there was a um, intentional um, relationship that we created there, right? And so, yes, I am their case manager um, and I am working with them to get into their units or they're already in their units and we're trying to 
build upon um, their success in those units, we still want to make sure that the person will always um, feel safe and that they always feel supported. Like that is intentionally our jobs, right? Is to make sure that we're able to help folks. Um, you may be the only person that that client feels safe around and that client only yells around um, you. They can get a release and are not traumatized from it. So there's two different instances here. It's the thought of um, when small children cry because they see their mom, they even cried all day. And then mom comes in the room and now they're a ball of tears. It is one of those things that that is just the connection that they have um, with that particular person and being able to really help them to navigate um, where they are and the reasons that they're yelling um, or screaming or throwing things or dropping pins or whatever um, their behavior action is um, and address how we can get to um, help them, but keep everybody's safety in mind. Let's see, thank you. I was trying to prevent from the next slide, please. Uh, I saw that it was it was transitioning. Uh, so, you know, another key principle is trustworthiness and transparency. We are in a world that things will change and happen in a split of a second, right? And sometimes we're not always thinking about how we can be transparent in that moment, but always above anything else, just really being trustworthy, right? Thinking again about how we create and foster a sense of safety, people feel safe when they know exactly what to expect and also that people will follow through. It is nothing more annoying than having one interaction with someone and not seeing them again, right? Or understanding what the process is. Um, it is, I recently got, got new furniture and they told me that it would be here on Tuesday and I sat around all day on Tuesday waiting. And in fact, they called me on Thursday and said, we're on our way. Well, that was Tuesday, you know? So now I'm, if I understood that it would have been Thursday, then I would have been more prepared for a Thursday, right? Um, so this is the exact same thing. And now I will never shop or garner right again because now they're not trustworthy. See how that worked out? You have to be in any of the senses that you guys are, are interacting with the client. Think about it in ways that you've experienced those things in, in, in an everyday life, right? We want everybody to be trustworthy and transparent. We want to understand what the steps are, what's going on. And sometimes you don't know, right? But just being able to be transparent and, to, and being trustworthy to say, I don't know what that looks like. Um, we all been let down. I sat at home all day on Tuesday, anxious and waiting on, on furniture that didn't come for three days later. So we've always all been in a place where we have been let down, right? And so clients are not exempt um, from those exact same interactions and those same uh, disappointments. Um, when thinking about this in a deep escalation context, helping people to know what's coming, that you're going to follow through, on what you agreed upon, you're consistent with help, will reduce people's anxiety. Um, and as well, they won't have them on edge or defense because they recognize that you folks are partners, right? And you're both um, invested in this partnership moving forward and in a very um, productive manner. Um, saying that I don't know, you know, is acceptable. It really shows that we're all human. You're not the, the savior. Um, of the entire world's dynamics, you don't have all the answers. It really brings it back down to a very um, human level approach, right? Where your clients aren't thinking of you as a superwoman or a superman and really being able to combat every, any and everything that they need, right? Um, your clients assume that you have all the information because you are the subject matter expert. But there are times here, especially in this interaction with the clients where they're the subject matter experts. Same thing here with this training. Here we are, we're giving you folks training, but you're on the ground, you're doing this work and you understand exactly what needs to happen. So being in a space to say, I don't know, is totally okay. You know, we don't have the answers to everything. We don't know um, how to, to make it from point A to point B in every, every situation, every scenario. Um, this leads nextly to our next principle um, that really talks about peer support. Peer support is 
perfect. Peer support is the greatest. It is amazing, right? And it's to think through um, creating an environment where people can ask questions and really lift up each other and learn from each other. It is nothing like having someone to connect with and interact with that you understand what they're going through um, and you're able to offer advice. Um, as you think about peer support and de-escalation and providing opportunities for peer support in trauma-informed way. Um, I think about the power of connection. We all know someone that knows something about something. And it's very, uh, it's always soothing for us to be able to reach out to that particular person whom you share that experience with. Um, for those folks that are in the support to peer role, um, you have a very special sense to those clients. You have a very special sense to that organization because you're able to see the information. Uh, you're able to, to provide context on information that folks are learning, right? That we're learning through trainings like this. And it, it helps you to connect the two uh, boxes. Um, and so you could use in motivational interviewing skills um, you can make those connections. You can have the peer to um, interact with clients on a regular basis, quarterly basis, whatever that looks like. But given just allowing the opportunity to be there um, for peer support to be able to, to assist with the client. Are there folks that are currently um, using the peer support uh, framework in their work today? Are there, or two part question, are there any peer support specialists that are um, on the call with us today? If you wanna raise your hand or drop it in the chat, either will work. Perfect, we got some peer support specialists um, here with us today. Yes, Elliot, it does work out. I'm not sure if I qualify, but I work with queer youth ages 13 to 24, and I am within that age range. Yes, that absolutely works. It's nothing like being able to talk that, that teenage language. I trip up on it with my nieces and nephews on a very regular basis, um, and I've recognized like I'm the old aunt. I used to have old aunts, and now I'm the old aunt. Um, so yes, it is very very appropriate and very great that you're there to be able to speak their language. Perfect. All right. So the next one here, um, and I'll say also, if you don't have peer specialists on your team, I highly encourage you um, to consider adding this valuable role. A peer, su peer support specialist, they really offer a unique uh, expertise that folks with lived experience really um, can bring to a table and without having that experience, you're unable to really uh, focus or you're unable to really focus your efforts on things that you're not very familiar with, right? Um, so the next key principle is collaboration and mutuality. Um, there have been trainings conducted with colleagues of mine who have had a great visual for this, but of course I can't show you through the screen, but he demonstrated walking with the person side by side instead of walking behind them or in front of the person. That's what this is about. Being able to um, debunk some of those power dynamics um, and each one of us is an expert on our own right. We've experienced different things personally. We've, di we've experienced different things uh, professionally. And so being able to bring your expertise um, to the table, but thinking about in the in the trauma informed approach to de escalation, it is critical not only to remind yourself of this, but to live in your work and remind those that you're working with of the same thing. When someone's escalating, ask how you can help to achieve your goals. How can we work together on this? And sometimes you may even need to take a step back to identify what the struggle is. And is, this is the in the first place, right? And so is this the first time that this has come up? Has this come up somewhere similarly before? Really taking a space to step outside of 
the intentional work that you folks are doing to make sure um, that it's understood uh, the collaboration and it's mutually understood like where this this train is moving right um and so oftentimes with when a person is extremely upset their brain is in fight or flight um we talked about this earlier and they may not be able to identify what's going on but they do know that something is upsetting and it's a feeling and if you will um you've known that feeling right we've all been there like I am just not in it today. I don't exactly know why I'm not in it, but I'm just not in it, right? Um, so taking a pause, even if it's just to take a breath and to sit quietly is powerful, right? It allows you to absorb the information, allows for them to absorb the information. It allows for us to um, sit somewhere and, and intentionally be in a space to think about what is needed or what the challenge is. Um, and even reflect on some of the, the success, right? What have we done well? And that could be part of how you foster additional uh, collaboration and mutuality. Here's where we've been. This is what we're doing now. This is where we're hopeful to go. Um, and so that also is part of like your transparency piece, recognizing all the steps in the process and that everybody is on the same page um, of that process. Um, if you are in a management role, um, partner with your staff to help them achieve their goals is a, a different side of this, but still around the collaboration and mutuality. Um, staff development comes in well, um, understanding what some of the roadblocks they're encountering are in the midst of, um, and just really taking the time to use those motivational interviewing skills to really get down to the root of some things that are happening and, and things that we want to um, fully address. I'll take a pause there. Are there any questions? Comments, questions? If so, feel free to drop those in the chat. We're, we're actively keeping up with the chat to um, address anything that you guys have in the chat. So feel free. Um, the last key principle is empowerment, voice, and choice. The people you work with are beings, right? They are a person. We are people. Um, they have family. They have friends. We have family. We have friends. So we are all um, persons, right, that bring multiple gifts to the table. How are you validating their gifts and experience and lifting those up? How are you reinforcing that people have choices and get a say? Um, as you think about this in a trauma-informed de-escalation context, I want you to think about the times when you've worked with folks that are getting really upset and we and what we thought was a really clear plan and goal, right? So this point, you, you met with this client X amount of times, you guys got a workflow of how things go. You meet on Thursdays, two o'clock, every two weeks, um, just to kind of check in to see what's going on. Um, and you feel tension rising, right? You, it's good to have a few phrases in your back pocket, really to be able to pull out where the tension has come from and how you guys can really move to the next step, right? making sure that you're on the same page. A simple question is, help me to understand. Um, are we both on the same page? Did you misunderstand? Did the person you with, you're working with change their minds? Um, are there things that you didn't recognize in the shift? Um, are there things that have happened that the client has just remotely uh, mentioned or a staff has remotely mentioned that hasn't really come to the forefront of being of importance and now it's 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 sort of transitioning to now that that thought and those things are now important um asking someone to understand shows you know humility on your part right it shows that you're human I thought that I understood it now that I now I don't so now I'm here back trying to understand you know where where we lost the communications um, you have to be able to find new ways um, and to, to work and navigate with clients. And it very well could be uncomfortable for them. It may be uncomfortable for you, um, but recognizing like the whole point of these interactions with folks are to really allow them to build on their individual strengths, 
show you're on the same page and also show humility. Um, and so being able to keep all of the principles into one forefront is hard. We're not going to remember all of these at one time, but being very intentional and conscious and the way that you are handling and dealing with either your clients or handling, if you're in a supervision role, handling and dealing with your staff together. Um, does anyone have additional examples um, or principles that you'd like to share of all the ones um, that we've discussed? I hope that you folks were able um, to gather um, from my section really some ways that, you know, you could use each one of these um, at the same time, in the same meeting, over multiple times that you've met with folks um, in, in different variations of forms. Um, it can be a little hard to separate each one of these out. But hopefully some of the examples were helpful and you guys were able to um, get more um, things in your toolbox to be able to use. Um, and so with that, I will pass it over to Catherine. All right. Thanks, Catherine. Um, hi, everybody. OK, so we've talked about a lot of foundational things relating to active engagement and trauma-informed de-escalation. So now we're going to talk about boundaries, both personal and professional. So I find that boundaries tend to be hard for a lot of people, I think, um, especially for people in the helping professions. So having clear boundaries can help keep us and the people that we're working with safe and also just help people to know what they can expect. So thinking back to what Jasmine was discussing around um, transparency and trustworthiness, um, really letting people know what they can expect is a really important part of um, setting clear boundaries. So, and we're going to talk about both um, personal and professional boundaries. So we'll walk through each category in detail in just a minute, but before that, just wanna like kind of sum it up in an elevator speech. So for per personal boundaries, those are the ones that you set for yourself. So they're not determined by your workplace. There's more room for defining those by yourself. For professional boundaries, those are the ones that are set up by your organization. So like they're more uniform and there's policies and procedures in place. Okay, so let's dig in. So we'll start with some components of professional boundaries. So professional boundaries tend to be a little bit more clear. So we don't need to spend as much time with these, um, but we do wanna kind of call out uh, a, a few of these and um, identify some of the differences between professional and personal boundaries. So the first component of professional boundaries is that the engagement is time bound. So you're there for a very clear purpose. You're working for an organization um, and you're there for a limited amount of time. So whether that's when the client moves on or when you do, it's not a relationship that's going to continue forever. Next is that you serve a distinct role and purpose. So your work with the client will be focused on very specific and discrete tasks. And as part of that, your work has um, very clear structure. So you have specific hours, with specific people doing specific things. Um, it's just very clear what role you're playing. So this doesn't have to be super rigid, but at the end of the day, having the structure and clarity of purpose is just helpful for everybody involved. And then the next component of professional boundaries is that there's power dynamics at play. So a couple points on this one. Um, one is that the power imbalance is almost always in favor of the professional or the worker or person getting paid to do the task. So as we talked about already, your client um, has personal agency and their dreams, ideas, plans need to be at the forefront of your work together. But as the professional, the power imbalance favors you ultimately. Um, and that's what makes it a professional boundary and not a personal one. So similarly, as part of your role, you have responsibility for the welfare of your client or non-professional to sort of put it more generally. And then I think the picture on the screen sums it up nicely. So we use healthcare um, as an example here in this visual because it's so abundantly clear. You wouldn't ever be 
responsible for the work of your doctor, right? So they are specifically trained to assist you and provide care. The same is true of your relationship with your clients. You're there to provide a specific kind of care that you were specifically trained for. So that said, just as with the relationship between you and your doctor, it's important that you and the person you're working with discuss information, learn relevant details, and talk about goal planning. Um, just as your doctor wouldn't order an MRI or certain meds if you hadn't shared information that made them think it might be helpful. Uh, and it's so important to be really cognizant of power dynamics. I can't emphasize this one enough. Uh, as much as you can diligently work to share power, be Trump informed and empower people, at the end of the day, the power imbalance is still there. Um, and I can guarantee that your client is acutely aware of it as well. And unfortunately, they're likely reminded of this in multiple ways. So we could dig in a lot further on power dynamics. At the end of the day, I would just challenge you to make sure that you're keeping power dynamics in the back of your mind at all times and just doing as much as you can do to share power. The next component that makes a boundary professional is that rules and boundaries guide your relationship. So these things are written very clearly in personnel and policy manuals or policy and procedure documents. Uh, it identifies like who can you accept gifts from, when and how can you communicate and with whom, what are you allowed to share, what types of topics can you discuss, that sort of thing. All of these things are clear distinctions of professional boundaries. And the final component of a professional boundary is location. The activities you conduct are in specific places and are likely dictated by your workplace. So for, for instance, if you're an outreach worker, this might be on the street, in your office, in a van, um, all different sorts of places where you're conducting your work. If you're a therapist, you're likely in an office or out in the field, but either way, it's gonna be somewhere private as the types of conversations that you have with people just require a different level of privacy um, than a lot of other professionals. And another example, if you work in a shelter, your work is likely not gonna take place outside of the walls of that building that you operate in. You may be transporting people to various places or things like that, but primarily it's going to be taking place in that building. So those are some examples around what we're talking about with location. So there's really good reason to have location included as a professional boundary. It helps keep us and the people we work with safe. So for this one, it's important to keep your surroundings in mind and aware of them at all times. So this is also hearkening back to something that Jasmine had touched on a little bit earlier as well around safety. So make sure that you know where your exits are and that you don't have yourself or anyone else sort of blocked in. Um, and it may feel tempting to not pay attention to this if you know the person that you're working with really well, but it's still, it still um, is an important thing to keep in mind. And then just one other note on location. This is another one where it's important to keep HIPAA in mind in terms of what you say and where. So for example, if you're meeting with someone in a public location, just ensuring that you're out of earshot of others if you're going to be discussing personal information. Okay, so we've covered the key components of professional boundaries. Now we will shift to personal boundaries. So these tend to be a little bit more squishy and difficult to navigate. Um, so that's why we spend a little bit more time with personal boundaries. So to dig into this, we'd like to start with a quick brainstorm or sharing exercise. So we just want you to either think to yourself or put into the chat um, some responses to these reflection questions. So as you think about boundaries, what are what boundaries are most helpful when you do your job? So let's start with that one. If you can just put responses in the chat box or just sort of think to yourself about it. What boundaries are most helpful when you do your job? Not taking on other people's crises as my own. Clearly communicating your availability.
turning off the work phone on nights and weekends. That's mentioned a couple of times, sort of boundaries around when clients can get a hold of you. Yep. Those are all really helpful. I think um, one that has always been really helpful for me is around like self-disclosure, which we'll talk a little bit more in a little bit, but it's always difficult to know kind of like how much to share about myself, but um, that can be like a really, really important boundary to keep in mind. Okay, so let's, thanks everybody for your responses. Um, let's move on to the next question as well. So what are your go-to boundaries when a situation starts to escalate? So for me, another example for myself is like keeping an even tone of voice. And I think that that was something that people had mentioned earlier as well. So as someone starts to escalate, kind of maintaining my tone of voice as opposed to sort of matching theirs. So when a situation starts to escalate, what are your go-to boundaries? Okay, slowing things down, body language. Yep, lots about body language and tone of voice. These are all really great. Thank you all for sharing these examples. Um, I'm gonna move us on, but feel free to continue putting other examples in the chat box. So when it comes to personal boundaries, respecting personal space is a really big one. So building on the location boundary we discussed earlier, think about where you might usually meet up with a person. Is it okay with them if you see their campsite or their space? How do they define their space? So these are questions that are really important to sort of be asking yourself. Um, just another mention for this one is that even personal items are an extension of personal space and everyone is different in their perception of personal space. So person A may want to welcome you openly into their space while person B may be incredibly guarded and protective of their space. So there's really no right way and it's your job to really observe and explore with the person what they're comfortable with and just have a clear understanding of what you're comfortable with. Comfortable with. Um, and then I would also mention that if, if you and the person that you're working with are culturally different from one another, and I'm using the term culture very generally in terms of like gender, religion, race, et cetera, there may be even more of a learning curve for you to understand the other person's boundaries. So it's really important to be patient and just very respectful when it comes to personal space. Physical interactions are another biggie when it comes to personal boundaries. Uh, can you move to the next slide? Um, so physical interaction. So do you hug someone? Do you not hug someone? Um, do you pat someone on the back? How do you know what personal interactions a person is comfortable with? So um, I have a really great example for personal interactions. Actually, a colleague of mine recently shared a story with me uh, where she worked in a shelter and had the wake up protocol that was like pretty rudimentary. So if someone wanted a wake up call before lights went on, they would go and tap them on the shoulder. And she said that a gentleman asked um, for a wake up call. So when it came time to wake him up, she went over and sort of tapped him on the shoulder and he like whipped around and shot straight up in the air and it was very clear that he was terrified. So she stepped back with her hands up and just said, hi, this is so-and-so and you're at such and such shelter and asked for a wake up call. Um, and then she just stood there kind of not moving for a minute. And it took him a good couple of minutes to calm down enough to sit down. And she really felt like she had seriously messed up and that he was suffering for it. She apologized and um, later he came up to her and said, I'm so sorry, I should have told you this before when I asked you to wake me up. I'm a veteran and had some really bad experiences when I was in Vietnam. When someone would tap us on the shoulder, it meant really bad things were happening. So next time, if you need to wake me up, please touch my foot. That way I'll know it's someone safe. So um, they got clearer 
about uh, sort of that expectation. And that was really helpful. Uh, and we could spend a lot of time talking about sort of perhaps how that shelter setup was not super trauma informed. But the big takeaway is really like just the necessity of consent based culture. So is it okay if I shake your hand? Can I give you a high five? It's just really important to ask these things. Otherwise, the consequences can be really devastating. Um, and then just another note on this one real quick is to remember that, um, as we talked about a, a minute ago, personal items are, again, an extension of personal space. So everyone is different in their perception of personal space. Something that may just seem trivial to you may be crucially important to another person. So before you move something, take something, be sure to ask. Uh, because just taking something or laying hands on it without permission can be deeply personal. Uh, so another personal boundary is that of self-disclosure. So how much do you share about yourself? Of course, there are the items that are dictated by your agency, but it's important to know for yourself what you're comfortable sharing or not sharing. So like I mentioned a minute ago, I know for me, this one is always really tricky because I think sharing or disclosing information about myself can be really helpful in terms of rapport building, but there's definitely a fine line between appropriate and inappropriate sharing. And sometimes if we share too much, it can put the client in an awkward position of feeling like they're sort of in the therapeutic role and that's also just not okay. So the same here goes for past trauma and how you keep yourself safe. So it's okay to set boundaries on what you want to talk about or not talk about. And just because someone else is okay sharing doesn't mean you have to. And actually sometimes um, when you set a boundary around what you're not gonna share, I think it can be empowering for the other person to feel like they don't have to share everything. Um, and I think it's also helpful to have specific topics in mind that you know you aren't going to touch and to have a standard line about what you're going to say if they do come up. Uh, okay, so we've talked about the key components of professional and personal boundaries. So now I'm going to pass it back to Jasmine to discuss the steps for maintaining those boundaries. Boundaries, they're hard. Um, we are in places and spaces where we're the folks that are the helpers, right? Um, and so we have been in this world even for two days, right? You've just gotten a job two days ago. You're still in this profession and in this world to help. And so in the interest of helping others, you can't lose yourself. Um, I have always been told um, you can't pour from an empty cup. So if you're calling yourself trying to fill somebody else's cup, yours has to have something in it in order to pour out, right? Um, boundaries teeter the line of what you're pouring out and what you're not pouring out, right? Um, so here are a few tips and tricks to help you fill that memory muscle about really your boundaries and how you need to move those um, forward. So be consistent and maintain consistent communication. Um, what are your gen general working hours? Um, stick to those, right? I saw folks put in the chat that they don't respond on the weekends or they don't respond after hours or um, they only help um, the same, you know, help in the same ways. Just keeping some type of consistency, right? Times of day you'll answer your phone. Clients can know from two to three that you're available for calls. If you're not answering that call, that's because you're helping another client. Um, being uh, making sure that you're helping clients, um, but it's not deviating from the existing procedures, right? So it's really easy to say, "Give me a call when you're in a crisis." Um, but there are procedures that you guys have internally in your agencies in order to address those things, right? At some point, we all need to be taking a PTO. We all need to have mental health days. We all need to um, handle things that we that we need to handle and we're unavailable, right? Some days like this, you're in training for two hours. Um, there are times that you are unavailable. And so setting those, those expectations that you are not going to always be available to that client and for them to follow the correct or the, the proper protocols as much as possible will help them to understand that there are other ways and other folks that will be able to help them, right? Um, and so 
when this happens, you're able to create those boundaries, but also able to put clients to give you trust that they are able to help get help in other ways, right? Um, similarly, when you think that you're going, you're not going to be there, you're going to be late, um, given an updated notice to the tent, uh, to the client when you are coming, um, if the time has changed, just really being respectful of their time. And that teaches them to be respectful of other folks' time. If we're meeting at one o'clock and we're meeting from 1 o'clock to 1.30, that is our time slot. We're going to address what we can in this space. And then I have other clients, you know, that, that are looking for me to support and serve, right? Um, another note on consistency is making sure that your colleagues are also on the same page when it comes to policies and procedures. It's nothing like you and a colleague going um, to meet clients at the same time and your workflow is different than their workflow and they can expect something different from their case manager than, you can, than, than that client can expect for you. Um, just making sure that communication is consistent. It really brings us full circle back to um, that transparency piece and being trustworthy, right? So if I'm gonna if I'm gonna be a few minutes late, I'm gonna let you know I'm a few minutes late. Um, if I'm unable to keep that scheduled time because what we meet every week, um, just recognize that like next week I won't be able to meet. I'll be out of the office, but we can either ex uh, change the date and time, or we can pick it up, you know, the week after. Um, you want to make sure everybody that is involved understands um, the communication and how well. Um, it is going or how well it's not going, right? And so that you guys can make some adjustments um, in that fast. The next one um, is seek help in consultation. Um, there will be times that you need to pull someone in for your own consultation or for the client directly. This is good and a healthy thing. We are not the end all be all. There are other folks who have expertise in areas that you do not have, and that's okay. Everybody has a job, right? And so let's let's play on each one of our strengths in order to do what's best for the client. Case, comp, uh, case conferencing is a good tool. It really helps folks to weigh, your peers to weigh in on some of the challenges and the success that you've had. Um, you can walk through various situations. You can give and get advice. Um, you can always learn something from someone else. And so recognizing that every moment that you interact is a teachable moment um, is really how you're able to, to, to best to email the client, to best to help the client, right? Um, use supervision and consultation to help determine the appropriate professional boundaries in challenging situations. So you guys are having a conversation and you're using this space to really fill out what your relationship um, will look like moving forward, right? Is this where we talk shop for 10 minutes before and then, or 10 minutes, the first 10 minutes and then the next 20, you know, we're talking about very intentional things, you know, just really recognizing that you're never in a space that you are the only person um, that has the answer to this and really just being able to, to seek consultation. Um, being mindful of language and be sure to be trauma-informed. A, a person might be on your caseload um, and they're your client. We don't own people. Ownership is a heavy term um, and it really comes from past experience and traumas um, and it could be slavery or prison, domestic violence, many things. So really just being mindful of your words and how powerful words can be um, when you are interacting um, with folks. The next one, um, and uh, the next one is, what happens when you feel that your safety is at risk? Um, so before we end our time together, we wanna make sure we touch on what do you do when you feel your safety is at risk? Who do you call outside for help? And then what happens? If you think back to what we talked about in terms of what happens to our brains when we are afraid, there are a number of reactions that can happen to any given person. Please be sure that you're having these sorts of conversations with your colleagues. Um, the it's very important to be in clear on protocols so that you can respond instead of react. And that will save you a lot um, in the end. Build that muscle memory, right? 
Remember that there are a million steps to, to take before calling 911 and that calling 911 is not always a safe option for everyone. Um, use those tips and tricks we talked about earlier to take a moment to breathe, step away, create boundaries, making sure that your boundaries are in check. And it's okay if you're not the best person to de-escalate the situation, right? That doesn't make you any less skilled, disqualified in your job. It is a part of being human. And the fact that all of us interact and respond to different people differently, and that is okay. Avoid physical altercations, focus on relationship building and teaming, uh, keep your boundaries in check. Um, really wanting to understand like power dynamics that folks have and being able to address those, um, avoiding the, that physical interaction. Um, maybe instead of calling 911, um, do mobile crisis, teammate, invite your supervisor, just really be mindful of what involving 911 could mean in this current climate. Um, you should follow any of your agency's policies. Uh, do some work um, on the fire department and the police department within your, in your, your locality, right? Help them understand the program and establish community expectations when a call is made. Do they have other options for mental cri health crises in your community? Really take all steps serious in order to make sure that you're ensuring safety. Um, do not intervene physically. Keep yourself safe. Um, do not trap people in situations. Space and clear exits are key. Do not allow yourself to become trapped. Um, do not escalate the situation. Keep your cool. Do not take sides. Stay neutral. Um, you really want to be understanding that um, there are different interactions for different folks um, and, in, and then recognizing where you fall within um, those interactions. We want to make sure that if we're calling the police, um, that we understand what the dangers of, involve, uh, of involving law enforcement too soon. Are there reasons that clients are escalating in this way? Are, is this your new client? Are there ways that you um, are not understanding their interaction um, with the emergency response? And so just really, it is a lot to keep in your mind and be cognizant of as, as you interact with clients. Um, but I'm hopeful that, you know, in, in something in our presentation, um, you'll be able to stick with um, in your in your mind, and it'll come back to the forefront when you're in a when you're in an op when you're in options of de-escalation, right? Always pick you know the way that you know you first are most comfortable with, but then also that you have the skill set to do. Remembering that you know we are not experts by any uh, by any shape of the imagination. We know a lot. We all bring a lot. We're able to help um, clients. We're able to help our colleagues. We're able to help. Uh, folks that we are supervising, but recognizing we are not the end all be all. And what other partners that we add into this scenario or this situation can either add um, or bring back to the situation, right? Um, the next one is just check your awareness. If you're getting upset, why is that? What is the root of that? Breathe, right? Breathe. You know, one thing that you can do in any kind of stressful situation, work, home, professional, personal, in the grocery store, at the gas station, Trader Joe's, wherever you go, you know, there, there can be an instance um, where you're challenged, right? And so being able to breathe allows for that oxygen to get to your brain for you to fully recognize where you are in the moment and in the space and encouraging others to breathe, right? Um, almost every single time, it's not about you. There are going to be very small instances where it, there is something that you did that directly um, affects the client. Um, but every single time that the client screams and screams at you, it's not about you, right? Um, so just recognize it in this space and in this work that everyone involved is a human, yourself included, and that there are spaces that you have to understand that 
all clients are not going to move, uh, move and act and react in the same way, just as you as a human won't move and react and act in the same way. Um, if you're finding that you're struggling, check with yourself and find out how ways you can use some of the things that you, you've learned to help yourself, right? Is there something going on outside of work that's affecting your current situation? Did something remind you of a past incident that didn't go well um, that you planned? Um, are you in need of a break? These are all questions to ask yourself as a good reminder of how to take care of yourself and to really find spaces to do self-care, right? Again, you cannot pour from an empty cup. You have to pour from a place where you feel equipped in order to help folks move forward. Um, and finally, it's just practicing self-care. You need to take yourself to do this work. This is hard stuff. Um, if I find that my boundaries are starting to slip, my self-care is often starting to go by the wayside. If there are times where I feel like, you know, I am not at my best self, then I, then I take a day off so that I can recenter. I can re-understand the work. Um, there are times where you step away from things and you really get the opportunity to really see how things are moving, um, in terms of making sure that you understand. And in the event that you need additional help, CSH has some self-care uh, courses that you folks can join um, to help you really navigate um, this world, recognizing that even without a pandemic, we work in such a world that um, can be taxing on us, right? Pandemic adds an extra layer to that and finding ways that, you know, you are taking care of yourself, you're taking care of your families, you're taking care of the things that you have on your mind so that when you're able to meet with those clients that they're able um, to get to get the full self of you um, because you're not distracted or you're not, you're not having challenges of your own. Um, and so just being sure that you guys are taking into account yourself and the things that you also need. Um, and then I will turn that over to Lindsay um, for any questions you folks might have. Thank you guys. Thank you, Jasmine and Catherine. Um, I dropped into the chat for you all um, a learner guide that goes along with today. So it includes most of what we covered um, in the slides. And then also two additional documents around interacting with people that are um, intoxicated or using substances and then also engaging with people um, that have a mental health crisis um, just as helpful tools. Um, I know we covered a lot today. Thank you to the 150 of you that joined today. Um, I really appreciated Jasmine saying we're not experts and I just, we're not, we're all learning together and learning from one another. Um, and I hope, um, I know we covered a lot from active engagement to trauma-informed care, to motivational interviewing, to self-care, to escalation and de-escalization today. And I think um, the thing that I always think about in walking away from this discussion is uh, the importance of just knowing who we are as individuals and how we show up and work and all of the things that's going on that impacts the way that we engage um, is just a, is an important framing as we're thinking about how we engage with people in a trauma-informed way and then also work to de-escalate situations of just really knowing ourselves and what works for us and our own boundaries and the way that we respond for crisis and creating plans for those situations. So thank you guys, um, have a wonderful day. And um, I just wanna leave with this really amazing quote from Maya Angelou. Um, I think it very much applies to our discussion today. Um, we've, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people forget what you did, people never forget how, they made, how you made them feel. And so I think very much applies to our work. Um, so thank you guys, and I hope you have a wonderful day.